Thank you for joining. If you've not been to or watched one of these sessions before, I'm Sarita Puri and I work on the Global Plant Kitchens project at Maiden Hackney, doing events like this, as well as mentoring. And I have also been a teacher for Maiden Hackney for, I think, six, almost six years. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about my journey as a teacher as we get through this event. Um, if you are here live and you have any questions um, for me, please put them into the chat box and we'll get to them at the end of the presentation. And you will also be sent this um, a link to this presentation as well. And if you're watching it online, feel free to stop it and take notes and keep playing it and so on so that you get the best you can out of today's session. So I'll just run through um, what we're going to be doing uh, today and what I'll be covering. So if you've been to any of these sessions before, um, you might have seen that there's normally uh, me and a guest, um, but it'll be just me today. Um, and if you haven't been to one of these sessions today, you might not know about this project um, or about Made in Hackney. We are the UK's first community cookery school, plant-based community cookery school. We've been running for over 10 years in East London, and we really exist to promote healthy, nutritious, plant-based food that's good for the planet, good for people and good for animals. And we do that all in the most important thing to us is creating joyful cooking classes. And that's really what I want to um, sort of highlight today is the importance of bringing joy into the kitchen because food is what nourishes us. Food is what gets us through. It's what connects us. It's what we can all celebrate beyond any sort of other boundaries and barriers that there might be um, food is sort of ever present. And that's something that we really, really value at Made in Hackney. You can find out more about us on our website, as well as this pro programme in particular, which is Global Plant Kitchens, specifically developed to support anyone who wants to run their own uh, vegan or plant-based community cookery school. So today uh, we're going to be looking at four things. I'm gonna start with a short introduction to my journey as a teacher. Then we're going to go through the steps of planning classes, then how to promote the classes. And then finally, how do you actually run those classes with a little bit there about evaluating and learning from them. Now, all of this um, material in this session is really complemented by what is on globalplantkitchens.org. So please do look there. This is over and above what's on there, though. So if you're just looking on there, you won't get um, all these little special tidbits of information. So I first heard of Made in Hackney about six years ago. I was at an event and I saw our founder, Sarah Bentley, speaking. She was talking about the power of community kitchens. And I'd gone to that event because I was interested in perhaps setting up my own community kitchen or my own project. And I saw her and I thought, wow, what an inspiration. They're doing everything that I care about. They're working with the community. They're doing a plant-based approach. They really care about the planet. Um, and I just thought, well, I don't need to start my own thing. I can help her. Um, and then maybe I can get my own experience and one day I'll do my own thing. So I reached out to Sarah and she got back to me and I chatted with her and the team about my experience. So I'd come from a background of doing a lot of training and facilitation, um, but I'd also been working, uh, doing my own sort of food events. I'd been doing supper clubs, pop-ups. I was working in the street food scene as well. And I'd sort of recently taken a bit of a career change from having a nine to five job. So it was kind of an ideal job for me, linking my sort of people skills and my uh, bringing people together skills to my real passion for food and for um, community and for activism. So I was really sort of pleased to join Made in Hackney as a teaching assistant. And I think that was a really, really good way to start because I got to essentially shadow a teacher. I got to be their sort of second in command. I got to see how they did things. I got to understand the setup in the kitchens um, and still be a really, really active part of the class leading on certain activities, but not having the full responsibility. So I would say if there's a way to sort of build that into your work or your project, that's a really good way to start. Then after having 
um, maybe I did that for about a year uh, and also volunteered at other Maiden Hackney events. And then I started teaching. So at Maiden Hackney, we um, have a teacher training program. So when I was trained as a teacher, it was we all got together in the kitchen and Sarah and maybe one other person um, basically taught us a class. But instead of, say, a one or two hour class, the session was, say, four or five hours long because we were then learning all the different parts of being a teacher. And we were doing the activities, but then we were doing them thinking about things like um, how do you plan or how do you introduce things? So, again, I think that's a really important part of how you run your classes. Um, so once I'd done the teacher training, uh, that was me. Uh, released into the wild I think maybe we did we you do you co-host to begin with I can't exactly remember my very first class um but I've been doing that um ever since um sort of ad hoc as and when it's required so I will run one-off classes for the community I'll run three or six week courses but I'll also also do the paid for master classes and if you want more information on our types of classes and um, there's a lot more on the website but we will talk a little bit about it today if you have been on global plant kitchens this is module four and at the start of module four and um, we talk a lot about what do the community want and what do the community need now that is the number one thing that you need to do it's all very well and good saying you want to run plant-based classes or you want to run community classes but what do the community want now the one thing we've heard several times through this project is there might not be an appetite for vegan food in your area vegan food is still quite niche plant-based food um and so what you have to do is sort of think about the fact that your food can meet any other outcome needed do people want to learn to cook on a budget probably. Do people want healthy options? Yes. Do people fancy to have nutritious food? It's likely. So these are all different ways you can tap into the community's needs, but through your plant-centered approach. And I've said on this slide, what does your community want and what does your community need? So people might want to learn how to make um, pizzas. Brilliant. But you might also have your public health or your local health team saying, we need to be increasing the portions of fruit and veg that children consume in our neighborhood. So it's a little bit about speaking to the community directly, as well as speaking to other agencies, organizations, and people that work with and for those in your community. Now, if you're starting off on your own, which many people do, the next thing is to really think is about what are you experienced in? What do you like? Now, I am very much a savoury person, so I'm not going to be running a six week baking class, even if everyone wants to learn cakes. I'll add a little cookie or a brownie to the end of my classes, but I wouldn't be my best teacher if I had to teach um, a baking course or a pastry course. So that's not what I'm going to do. I will bring in an expert. Um, and in Maiden Hackney, we have many, many people uh, now that do different um, cuisines or techniques. Uh, do you know what works well? So what I mean by that is what is a good thing to teach? If I'm teaching something that I get all the ingredients in the pan and then it has to sit for an hour and we're not doing anything, that's not that exciting. I can fill that time with other dishes or perhaps activities, but really thinking what lends itself to being a taught class. Um, how do you find that out? I would say have a look on our website, Made in Hackney, because we've been doing this for 10 years, um, and look at other community projects, especially if you're not in the UK, what you're, what works well in your situation um, might be different to ours. And the other thing there is about what um, equipment or what space do you have or could you access? Um, we work, we, we're mentoring um, a group in Peru at the moment through this project and they work in really rural communities without access to sort of running water or gas mains and so on. So what they can deliver in their community kitchen might be very different to somewhere like us that has a fully plumbed and integrated kitchen. 
The next point that we've got here is about food policy requirements or restrictions. So at Made in Hackney, our food policy was initially written to be seasonal, local and organic. So that was the sort of foundation of what we um, taught. You might uh, decide to be doing things that are zero waste or minimal waste. So that might impact what you're doing. You might be focusing on certain products or certain ingredients, like maybe you're working on a campaign to increase um, pulse consumption. So things like chickpeas and lentils and so on. And then in terms of requirements or restrictions, um, similar really to what I said there about the space that you have, or perhaps you have, um, you need to, to run your classes that are fully kosher, fully halal and things like that. Again, that might be coming from you as an organization, but that is also about you understanding your community. And then finally, I've mentioned here about online classes or face-to-face. -face. We now do a mixture of both. We started online um, during uh, 2020 when there was lockdown restrictions. And we have actually continued them ever since because they have been successful. They're a really good way for us to reach more people. Um, but I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. And then finally on there, are your classes going to be free or are they going to be paid for? This we go into with um, more information and examples in the Global Plant Kitchens um, module and toolkit. Uh, so I won't go into too much detail here, but essentially our community classes are all free to uh, service users or community members. And then our paid for classes will be things like master classes, more skilled techniques, or it might be that we do receive payments for our community classes, but those are from partner organizations that might fund us to work with that group. But the people that come, um, do not pay. Now, I know that that funding model doesn't work for everyone, um, and it might be that you have to put in a nominal charge, so something like two pounds, five pounds, five euros, depending on where you are. So thinking about what class to run before you put something on, really, really take some time um, to do this. You can run um, trial classes as well, get some friends, get some community members. You know, you don't need to be going out there and you know giving it to to everybody until as a sort of formal class until you really know what you need to do kitchens are notoriously stressful places especially when you bring 15 people together and there's pots all steaming there's people moving about maybe someone's broken something so a lot of it's about crisis management um logistical skills timekeeping, problem solving, um, as well as being a welcoming, friendly individual, and as well as having the knowledge about the food and the skills to sort of create the food. Um, one thing I also want to mention here is, you know, sometimes things go wrong when you're teaching and actually that's okay. Um, many, many times I have written a recipe, I've tested my recipe, I've shared it with a class, and then things, the, the recipe maybe hasn't turned out uh, when groups have started doing it. Now, there could be several reasons for that, but part of the process of cooking is about learning how to adapt, how to change, how to use your taste buds um, and your knowledge to make something really delicious. So in that situation where something doesn't quite taste right, we'll maybe add a bit more salt or add some more herbs. And so that is kind of a really important um, aspect of being a teacher. It's about being flexible. You know, you don't just have to follow a recipe step by step. And in fact, that's probably not how most of us cook at home. And given that we're teaching the community, we really want to be encouraging home cooks. We're not asking for people to be Michelin star chefs or working in a restaurant production line. We want it to be fun. We want it to be realistic. And sometimes things go a little bit wrong. So just embrace that and, and be able to sort of hold on to that. And then I've also got in here about understanding different people and group dynamics. This is really, really vital. I think that's kind of what I've I've learned from, from teaching and sort of the early things I've managed to reflect on is you can't sort of think, oh, well, 
um, people are always late or there's always greedy people, you know, some of these uh, um, assumptions and stereotypes that are not necessarily useful just because it's happened once or twice. Everyone will come with their own personality, maybe their own challenges, maybe their own opinions. Um, you might be working across a group of um, elders in the community, as well as some middle aged people and some younger people. And that way you need to think about the dynamic of supporting them in different ways. You might have people that have got um, English as a second language or who are from a different culture or community. Therefore, they might present themselves in a different way and have different social norms. So really consider that and don't just think, well, I wouldn't do it that way. So why are they doing it like that? You know, really just sort of remember that the whole part of this is community, common unity. This is your community. Um, and then finally, on being a teacher, this might be uh, yourself, if you're the one who's the teacher, or when you're working with other teachers and other people within your project, is really playing to your strengths. So I mentioned, um, I'm not going to do a big baking course, um, but one thing that I am really good at is working with uh, children and young people, because that was my career before I started doing all of this. Um, and that was really one of the things that when I got in touch with Maiden Hackney, they really uh, wanted me to help them because they didn't have anyone in the team at that moment in time that had that experience. And I'd been running training classes, making films and doing children's rights and all sorts of stuff. And then I just had to transfer that to um, working with children in a kitchen, which I absolutely love. So if you've got people um, that you know or that are keen um, or you want to do job adverts for specific roles, I would very much recommend that. So the next thing in terms of planning your class is about what are you going to teach? So the way that we do it at Made in Hackney is we have many different themes or topics. So I won't run through these all here. You can read them or they are also on the Global Plant Kitchens website. But we might do different cuisines. And we will focus on either what our teachers um, are skilled or experienced in. It might be from their own culture or one that they're truly embedded and knowledgeable about. Um, or we might try and reflect the cuisines of our local community. We are based in um, a very diverse area of East London. So we cook everything. And I think people love that. Then there's the technical um, elements. And these are where really, this is maybe a bit more advanced than your um, uh, introduction, but people love when we do things like bread making, uh, baking, fermentation, and you can really think about those, those core skills um, as well as things that can be quite affordable and accessible. Making your own bread is one of the sort of cheapest things you can do at home. Then we have topics. These are really important for us when we're trying to maybe engage with um, funders. So right now we're unfortunately in a cost of living crisis in the UK. So feeding four for five pounds and um, having 15 minute meals, low energy cooking, those are all super important. And they're the type of thing that we might be able to get more support to run. So even when you're thinking about what classes you want to run, you might also have to have your funding brain head on. And finally, calendar days. Now, we've listed the ones here that are relevant in the UK, but depending on where you live, there will be so many calendar days. Thanksgiving, if you're in the US, for example. Um, and these are always really fun, heartwarming classes. And in terms of um, recipes, so we've got some information in the module on how to decide what recipes to have. And um, we've got a list of about, I think, about 20 different commonly used dishes um, in our classes on Global Plant Kitchen. The best way you can rewrite a recipe for the teaching environment is to think, what makes sense? And then give it a go, okay? So that takes me on to my second point. Always test your recipes. Even if it's someone else's recipe, I have followed recipes from the internet and even from published cookbooks. And there's always something like nine times out of 10, that I would maybe tweak or do differently. It might be about seasoning, it might be about time, um, or it might just be about flavour. 
And so test your recipes because it will make you realize um, what it's like to run it uh, in a class and think, if I'm explaining this, what am I doing now? What are the main pointers? What do I have to tell people? And um, have them in, um, then you can write them up in a nice consistent format. And I'll show you that in um, a few slides. And then I just mentioned about using other people's recipes. So that is absolutely fine. You cannot actually own the intellectual property on a recipe because it is a list. You can own it. You can own it on. Um, and this is in the UK. Might be different where you are. Um, but you can own it on, say, the uh, the information and the story you tell. But a list is a list. Um, however, it is good common courtesy to acknowledge where you got that recipe from. And we would really like it if you say you get your recipes from us. Um, but I'm sure if you got them from BBC Good Food or uh, I don't know, Vegetarian Times or whatever. I would always recommend making a lesson plan. Um, I know that sounds like school, but at the end of the day, this is a community cookery school. And it's more than just reading out a recipe and talking people through it. You want to be thinking about um, your introduction. How long does that take? Have you got enough time for breaks? Are you going to do any additional activities? Um, how are you going to stagger the recipes? And in what order might you do them? So say you're doing a main meal and a dessert, you might actually cook the dessert first because it takes 40 minutes to bake in the oven um, and then do the main meal, eat the main meal and then your lovely cake is ready. So you've got to really think about practically what works and you will only do that if you plan. Um, now I normally make a full on lesson plan like I'll show you and then I make, I basically then on the day, write a bullet point list uh, saying like introduction 10 minutes welcome 10 minutes um just so I've kind of got it fresh in my head there so that I've not got my big long sheet but I've also been doing this quite a long time so just do this and um, find out what works for you again maybe it's not a lesson plan um what I would recommend is trying to do learning outcomes learning outcomes are where you state what skills and knowledge participants ha will have by the end of the session. And this is particularly important if you have um, funding and it's particularly important if you're trying to work with a certain group. So for example, um, I've done some work with uh, recent arrivals and asylum seekers in the UK. And part of that was to make them feel welcome, was to help them learn English. Now, if I've not got that as my learning outcome, apart from just cooking a dish, how do I know that I've helped? Nutritional balance is also super important um, and the type of dishes balance. So I'll show you on the next in a, in a couple of slides um, our eat well plate, but really thinking, um, have I got a balanced diet here in terms of protein, carbohydrates, several portions of fruit and veg? Um, if I'm making, say, a main meal and a side dish, even things like, oh, I've used chickpeas twice. Well, could I be a bit more inventive and maybe use tofu for one thing, chickpeas for another? Um, I've made, uh, say, a chickpea curry, and then I make a uh, crunchy cauliflower. Now they're both a brown beige color. That's They taste delicious, but do they look as appetizing? So where can I get some color into that? I'll make a slaw. I'll make a um, maybe I'll do a dressing or something or put some tomatoes in it, you know, thinking about the nutrition, thinking about the look um, and then thinking about the types of dishes. So um, we normally in our community classes will either have a sort of starter or a side and a main or a main and a dessert. Um, and sometimes we'll maybe do like a drink as well. So a nice uh, refreshing drink in the summer and then a lovely hot drink um, in the winter. One thing that I always tell new teachers is my times 1.5 rule. So if a recipe traditionally takes 30 minutes, a written recipe, if you were just doing it on your own, I always add at least 50% more time. So a 30 minute recipe to teach would take at least 45 minutes. Now, I would sometimes go up to two times, 
and this really depends on the recipe, but absolute minimum is 1.5. Think about if you're teaching people um, something that involves a lot of preparation and a lot of chopping vegetables. Now, I can chop quite fast, but other people might not, or they might need a bit of guidance, and they might say, is this size of carrot correct? And, you know, you need to go around the class, and everyone's doing it at different times, so always build in extra time. Um, you also need to build in your time for discussion, your time for chit chat, your time for questions, and most importantly, adequate time to eat, because this is where the joy all comes together. Um, also, when you're thinking about your class development, think about equipment. Now, I have been caught out before when I have not realized I've put too many things that belong in the oven. And I've gone, I don't have enough time, <laughs> um, but it always comes together. So really, really think, um, do you need things like blenders? Now, we do not have enough blenders in our kitchen. Um, so if I'm ever doing anything to do with blending, I make that a demo, okay? Because we do not have time and space for everyone to blend. So usually there'll be something to, if it's a, um, I'm using professional words, mixy blender, <laughs> uh, whatever that is, um, but we've got hand blenders. so that kind of is okay. Um, like I said, do you need the oven? Do you have enough hobs? Do you even have enough baking trays? Um, I think we only have one potato masher at Made in Hackney as well. So that's always a bit of a funny situation and people are mashing with different things. So really think about what you need. So when we lay out our um, recipes, we also have an equipment list. Then uh, next is sourcing ingredients. Um, do you have a budget? Uh, I our budget is about three pounds a head, I think. Um, and where are you going to get them from? Are you buying them? Are you getting them delivered? Do you have any partners like uh, suppliers and so on? Do you have food surplus? We also work with food surplus in our meal service. And then finally, teaching aids and tips. We have a whole pack of these in the toolkit on globalplantkitchens.org. Um, so please have a look. Um, they're a few years old, um, but you can sort of take ideas and adapt them and sort of think about different ways to teach and learn. And then the sort of final thing to sort of think about in class development, and that kind of speaks a little bit to teaching aids and tips, is really um, engaging different uh, people, different levels of cooking skill and different interest, really. You will have some people that race ahead, OK, and they'll have everything chopped They'll be on to the next part before you've explained it. Um, and what I tend to do there is I'll maybe give them an extra task. So um, I'll be like, hey, do you want to make a salad dressing? Help yourself to anything in the pantry. Um, tell me about allergens and so on and so forth. Um, or it's about uh, um, empowering them and giving them responsibility to help teach and support someone else in the class. So again, these are really important skills that you'll sort of learn over time. And what I would say is if there's ever a time where you're a bit unsure about something um, or you sort of think, oh, I could have done that better, then that's where you can reflect and sort of think about that for the next time. Um, but bringing people in is always a sort of nice way to do it. OK, so this is an example uh, lesson plan. Now, I've cut it off a bit to fit on the slide, but the full lesson plan example, including a blank template, is in the toolkit on Global Blank Kitchens. Um, and this is what we tend to do. We're like, well, what are the skills that they're going to get? Um, what is the foods that we're focusing on and nutrition? And this really helps you think, oh, actually, everything's a bit beige or I don't have any pulses or protein. Um, we talk about regional ingredients and whether or not there's um, any like local switches we can make um, or talking about this is a good opportunity to talk about things like food miles. Now, it's important to say here, we would never um, limit what we cook. But no, we would never uh, not cook something because it's not locally sourced. And um, we will just maybe not make too much of a focus of it. We wouldn't have um, the majority of our stuff will be locally sourced because we don't want to say, well, actually, Caribbean food, there's a lot of plantain, but you can't have your plantain. Or in India, you've got your okra, but you can't have your okra. We do not want to um, sort of, what's the word? Uh, go against people's uh, ways of eating because we know that then that's not a very inclusive attitude to have. So we it's all about moderation. 
Um, we talk about healthy switches and these are all things that can kickstart you thinking about what you're going to cook. Uh, sorry, what you're going to say and talk about. Um, and then talk about the learning outcomes there and then any teaching aids. And this is uh, an outline of a recipe. Now, we normally have um, all our recipes in a handout. We'll number them like one, two, three. We'll also have page numbers because you really want to be able to signpost people as much as possible. So recipe one on page one, we're now on step two, okay? Um, we always, this is our format. You can do what you want, but I'm just trying to show you a nice uh, accessible format. We'll tell you a bit about the dish. We'll say how many it serves, because if people then go to make this at home, they can make that decision on whether they want to half the recipe or try and double the recipe or so on so that it works for them. And then um, in terms of ingredients, so when I'm doing recipes, I try and put a weight in as well as the number of. Now, when you're cooking at home and you're cooking vegetables, you probably just go, oh, two potatoes. However, all potatoes are different. All carrots are different. All vegetables are different. So I do try and put in a rough weight for them. That's kind of up to you what you think. Um, and then tablespoons and teaspoons, we write that out in full just because putting like TSP or TBSP, not everyone understands that. Um, if you're joining us from the States um, or anywhere else that uses cups, um, that might be what you use or maybe it's ounces and so on. And um, we tend to put the ingredients in size order. So you're sort of thinking of the thing that's the most. Now, other places I have taught we do it in a order of when you'll use it. So sort of thinking about what works best for you um, and go with that. And then as you can see the method, like I said before, keep it simple, keep it short. Um, I try and break things down into as many different steps as possible. So you're not asking people to do two things at once. And then here is that teaching aid that I mentioned. Um, this is our Eat Well guide. So if you're based in the UK, maybe other parts of Europe, um, these are, uh, this is based on the NHS one, but ours is plant-based because we do not have any meat, fish, dairy, or any other animal byproducts in our food. And this is what we should all be eating um, at most meals. So a two thirds of your plate should be fresh, um, uh, should be fruit and vegetables. And that can include uh, frozen and, and tinned. Then two thirds um, is your sort of carbs, your grains. That's where your potatoes come in or your rice or your pasta. And then you've got um, your uh, protein. So we've listed some here and then your dairy alternatives and then a small slither of um, oils and good fats. OK, so that's really how you should think about um, planning your classes and planning your meals. OK, so we've done all the planning uh, we've got an idea. Now we need to get people to the class. So um, there is a lot more on this in our comms and marketing module on globalplantkitchens.org. Um, but really, the most important thing here is to think about um, how, what's, what are the words you're using? What are the, the visuals? Why are people going to want to come to this class? Now, you might be promoting your class through um, a partner organization. So we run classes um, where we might uh, promote them through a local diabetes charity or organization and they help us get people. But they still need the right words and the right visuals to attract those people in, okay? So what language is going to engage with the audience? Think back to what I said before about keeping it simple, keeping it accessible, um, using hook words like healthy, nutritious, um, budget, family friendly classes, anything that really speaks to it. Um, you also want to focus on the taste and the look and the feel of the food. So why would someone come to this? It's got creamy, roasted, nutty, sweet, all those lovely words that really get our mouths watering and make us go, yeah, I'm going to that class. Um, you want to describe the class content. So more than just you will learn how to um, make lasagna. So we have an Italian masterclass uh, coming up and we talk about um, making dough and learning about the history of the cuisine and things like that. Things that mean I'm going to come to this class and um, because I've got that added value. 
you might also want to highlight the provenance or the culture that the foods come from. So provenance is its roots. Um, so if I'm making a lasagna, I might talk about it being from Italy or the specific region of Italy where it's from. Or I might talk about um, the example of pakora in India. I might talk about the different regions of India and how everyone has different recipes. Um, or that pakora are commonly eaten at Diwali and at other festivals and weddings. And then finally, um, one thing that we're very passionate about at Maiden Hackney is strong visuals. So we're lucky that we've been running for over 10 years and in the past few years in particular, as phone cameras have got better or as we've had more people in the team with uh, camera skills, we can take our own really good quality photos. However, you can also, especially if you're starting out, get really good free images from Shutterstock and other free image websites. Just make sure that it's ones where the credits um, are free and then usually you would still just say where you got it from. So credit shutterstock and um, again we talk about that in the comms and marketing module so i won't go on about it too much here these are some examples of um strong visuals so i would say at least i think half of these are um from our classes or from our like meal service um, and the other half are maybe from online and um, so you can see that actually it's quite similar um, hopefully you can see that there's lots of colour, there's texture, there's different ingredients, and they really make me want to go to those classes. Okay, so next we're going to do um, how to then run the class. Okay, so there's sort of a little step before you actually start, and it's about um, it's about preparing people for that class. So for our community classes in particular, especially because they're free, um, and also some community members might have a lot going on in their life. Um, we make sure that we do reminders. Uh, we'll phone people or we'll email them if they're on email um, and we'll ask them to confirm that they're coming. Maybe we'll send a text message. Um, and we also have a waiting list. So that way, if people pull out, which does happen, um, we can fill that space. Um, this is particularly important if we're running, say, a six week course or a three week course, because if someone doesn't turn up for the week one, we would still love people to come for the following weeks. Really important to find out is af even after you've done your recipes, are there any dietary requirements or allergies? OK, now plant based food is sort of minimal risk, but you're still potentially handling nuts, soya, mustard. Um, gluten, some of the main allergens there. So really think, well, actually, if someone has a nut allergen, that could be quite serious. So let's not have any nuts. So that might mean that you have to rethink um, what you're doing. Or maybe if there's um, gluten, unless if someone's celiac, we would sort of recommend that they either don't come, to, they, they don't come to a class as gluten. But if it's a mild intolerance, we'll make sure we have options. So gluten-free breads or gluten-free oats or flour. And really important to know if people have any accessibility requirements. Now, that might be um, that they've got impaired vision or hearing. It might be that they're a wheelchair user or um, that they've just got limited mobility. They have to sit down or maybe they have to bring a care worker with them. So really, that's so important to find out. Um, also, if someone has different um, like neurodiversity, maybe like really loud pots and pans and noises might not be the best for them. So you might need to have a sensitive cooking space. And then um, if you're doing online classes, making sure that you um, that everyone who's coming to the class has the recipe and the ingredients in advance, because you're going to be demonstrating in your own kitchen and they're going to be somewhere else. So they need to know what they're doing. And then finally, really, really important, and I didn't mention it before, actually, is we run all of our classes um, with at least two volunteers and they are called class hosts. And they're there to sort of welcome people, make sure it's running to time, uh, helping with facilitation, washing up, you know, keeping the vibe good, all of that stuff. Um, and you cannot do it without them. So um, you really need to communicate with your volunteers, check that they know what they're doing introduce them to the teacher um, you know especially if they're new make sure they know what time to arrive um, and and all of that and then in case I forget to say it make sure that when you're planning your recipes to teach in a class 
you have factored in making enough portions to cover your volunteers. Because then also setting out uh, things like uh, putting a knife and chopping board on each station, putting the pots and pans out, remembering spoons. So going through that equipment list that you've made and thinking, how do we make sure that this class flows as good as it possibly can? Okay, so set up on the day. Um, I've mentioned about washing the veg. We always do that first ourselves. Um, aprons, putting an apron out on every station or having enough for everyone. Now we have made in Hackney branded aprons, but if you're not in a position to get branded aprons, uh, you can either ask participants to bring their own or uh, you can um, just source some general ones from a cooking store. Um, briefing your volunteers. So communicate with them in advance. But when you're there on the day, make sure they know what they're doing. Run through the process, especially if uh, you're, you're maybe going to do a different recipe in a different order or there's something they need to set up whilst you're doing um, something in particular. Um, always have a backup plan um, or as much as possible have a backup plan so the ovens stop working do you think you can do it on the on the hob um, only uh, four people turn up when you're expecting 12 so maybe everyone works on their own instead of in a group of three um, the worst situation is when volunteers don't turn up and it does happen so that's why I always get there super early as well um, but who is it you can phone to say, help, is there anyone who can come and stand in? Um, and so on. And then the order of recipes I've already mentioned. Running the classes. Start with a friendly welcome. That's what everyone wants to see when they come in the door, but also when you say hi, welcome to Made in Hackney. Um, that is really, really important. We sign everyone in on a sign-in sheet just so we know who's come and we register that all in our um, like online system. Really important is health and safety. Uh, so we do that as part of our introduction. So I'll start, I'll explain, hey, this is what we're doing today. We're going to be learning about Indian food. We're going to be doing a, a Christmas class. And then I'll normally hand over to one of the volunteers that to do the health and safety run through. We have an example health and safety run through on Global Plant Kitchen's website. So feel free to adapt that for your classes. Then usually um, I would explain a class and then I uh, explain a recipe and then sort of get them to sort of do part of it. And I'll sort of check in and do it step by step. I don't cook really in classes. Previously I had and I would kind of constantly demo everything. But actually you need to be going around and checking on people and making sure it's all OK. So I'll demo things that, are, that need to be demoed. So how to chop an onion or how to wash rice because everyone does it differently but I won't maybe demo I don't know pouring in a spoon of cumin for example um and then um there might be some things that like I said before I just demonstrate so if I'm making a coriander chutney a sauce I'll demonstrate that in the blender not everybody will do that and that's sometimes quite a good thing to do to um, reset the classroom give you that minute for the volunteers to be scurrying about and cleaning up and so on um, we always give out recipe handouts but we also have sort of accumulated recipes from other classes and we have them available at the side so if anyone wants to take a class from a different a recipe from another class they can do and that's a nice little added bonus um, really important to have breaks um, and really important to eat together at the end of the class. Like I said before, that's really, really joyful um, and really fun. Now, people quite often maybe don't want to eat or they've got different levels of appetite. So encouraging people to bring their own Tupperware or containers to take leftovers home. We do have a few that we'll keep in stock, but it's expensive. It's an added cost to us. So we do say to people, if you're coming for a free class, please bring your own containers. And if they're coming to several, keep reusing them. And then finally, the really important thing there is about um, making sure that you're capturing all this beautiful information and lovely atmosphere and activities. If you can take photos, if you can take videos, if you can get testimonials from people, um, always get their permission to use anything online or in any materials. Um, and also use it as an opportunity at the end for evaluation. Now, evaluation can be a form you fill out, it could be online, it could be paper, but it can also be getting those little nuggets of information. What have people 
um, learned today that they didn't know before? How has this helped their um, mental well-being and uh, their general joy of life? Those little things, if you can capture that, that's maybe more magical than a number on a spreadsheet. And then finally, always um, signposting them to anything else that you are running. So uh, the final thing that I'm going to talk about is online classes. These let us reach a wider audience um, and they're technically a bit cheaper to run because you don't need as much prep time and you're only buying ingredients for the chef, not for everyone else. They're shorter classes. So community classes are sort of between two and two and a half hours. These would be one and a half to two hours. Um, really important that you prepare well for this and um, that you think about uh, if people are in their own kitchens, they might not have access to all the ingredients. So you might need to think about substitutions and um, they might have technical issues. They might not have an oven um, or they might not have certain equipment or there might be other stuff going on in the background. So actually managing an online environment when there's 10, 20 people on screen can be a different challenge than manning managing humans in real life um, and a bit like this class today I'm just talking into a computer and um, so having a nice friendly uh, attitude is really important and um, because people don't want to be sort of looking up and sort of seeing someone who's really grumpy and concerned about their peas not being shelled I don't know um, and then finally make sure that you as a teacher have a strong internet connection and good lighting what you cannot see here is I have two lights behind this screen um, and if I was doing a cooking demo I would be using this screen and I would also have my uh, phone on a tripod doing top down um, over my pans and my chopping board so that people can see both me and the food and always 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 test everything in advance. Wow, so that was a whistle-stop tour um, of how to run joyful community cookery classes. We have a couple of minutes if anyone does have any questions. And um, we have a question here. How do you make sure that everyone is active? That is a really good question. So this is where being, this is why I wouldn't necessarily cook and demo myself because I will always go around the classroom um, and that's why you also have volunteers. Now, some volunteers are a bit more shy. They might not want to do that face-to-face -face bit, but they might say, oh, so-and-so over there sitting in the corner, they're not really engaged. Um, it's also about getting to know people. If it's a one-off class, you might not get to know them, but if you're doing a course over a couple of weeks or if people come to your classes regularly, then you'll know who likes to engage in what way some people might just be more comfortable doing certain things um, or some people might be shy to begin with. So it's this is again about um, about your teaching skills. So normally I would go around and I'd say, hey, have you finished? Um, or hey, do you want to do these mushrooms now? And just sort of have, have a little chat, find out if they've got any um, concerns or issues that maybe is making them um, not take part. Another challenge there can be when you're working in groups. Um, if you've got three people at a station, um, you, only one person can be stirring that pan. And sometimes you have a dominant person. So what can the other two people do? So I might then sort of say, right, do you want to go and get the pasta ready to the other person if we're making the sauce? Or I'll say to the person who's dominating, being like, great, love that you've taken the lead there. How about you let this person have a go? So that is kind of it. That's just for me to say thank you. And um, thank you for joining. Thank you for watching. Um, it's been really lovely to just talk about uh, being a teacher. It's something that brings me lots and lots of joy. And I really hope that it can bring you joy and that we've sort of inspired and supported you um, on that journey.